Hi, Katie, welcome. Thank you, thanks for having me. So happy to have you. I would love if for those of us who are not astrophysicists, you could, you could return and help us give a little refresher on how the universe did begin and how we know that. Right, right, yeah. So um, we know actually quite a lot about the early universe, about the beginning of the universe, um, because we can actually see it. Uh, and this is this is a, the the wildest part of astronomy that we can see the beginning of the universe. Um, so the universe is about thirteen point eight billion years old, and when we look out into the the cosmos, we see distant galaxies. And when we look at the distant ones, they're all moving away from us. And so it's for a long time there's been this idea that well, if the galaxies are moving away from us now, they must have been closer to us in the past. The universe in the past must have been smaller in some sense, uh, the, the, you know, hotter and denser, everything packed into less space. Um, and that's the Big Bang Theory, the idea that the universe was smaller and denser and hotter in the past. Um, and we, we got really direct evidence of that in the 1960s when, when we were able to actually see the light from the very early universe. So, so let me take one more step back. When we look at a distant galaxy, the light from that galaxy takes some time to reach us. So we see, you know, we see a galaxy shining, that light might have taken a billion years to cross the space between there and here. Um, we can see galaxies that are so distant that the light took 10 billion years, even 13 billion years to reach us. Amazing. And the universe is only 13.8 billion years old. So what happens wow. if you look at something so far away that the light has taken more than that, you know, more than 13 billion years to reach us? What, what happens like when you when you try and look at something even farther, well, there's a limit to how far you can look the the observable universe, and that limit is is uh, defined by how long it takes the light to travel. So if if something is so far away that the light would take you know 15 billion years to reach us, we can't see it because the light hasn't gotten here yet. But if we look at something that's you know so far away, the light's taken 13.8 billion years to reach us. Then what we're looking at is a time when the universe was just beginning. We're looking at the light from the very beginning of the universe, and what we should see if we look at something that far away is fire, right? <laughs> so we we assume we we take this idea that the the early universe was hot and dense. Everywhere in the cosmos was like filled with this sort of roiling plasma, and so if we look far enough away, we should see it because we're looking so far back in time that we're looking at the time when the whole universe was on fire. And we do see that, <laughs> like shockingly, we actually do see that. When we use microwave telescopes, um, we, we see this background light. Every direction we look, if we, you know, at the edges of our vision is this, this heat, this fire. And, and we, we know that it's heat, we, we can analyze the, the spectrum of the light, and we can see that this microwave light, this radiation, is the kind of light you get when something is just glowing because it's hot. And so we can see that every direction we look, if we look far enough away, we're looking so far back in time that we're seeing an Earth, a universe that is still on fire. Um, so that's the Big Bang. Exactly what happened, you know, around that time, how that fire got started, that's a whole other very complicated story that we're still <laughs> figuring out. So we think that, you know, before the fiery part, there was this inflation, this, this rapid expansion. Before that, maybe there was a singularity, maybe not. We don't know. Um, we don't know what started that, that rapid expansion. But we do know that for the first 380,000 years of the cosmos, it was this sort of the whole, all of space was filled with this fire. And we, we know that because we can see it. It's amazing. Well, let's get into some of the, the juicy specifics of how exactly the universe might end. I know that you've talked sure. to many other cosmologists yourself mm -hmm. and that there are a lot of different theories on this. Where do you think we should begin? Dealer's choice. What, what's, um, what's in store for us? Yeah, well, so the one that, that is as far as we know, the most likely, the one that we we talk about the most in cosmology is the heat death. So this is what I what I discussed in my in my TED talk. And the idea there is that you know the universe is currently expanding, galaxies are getting farther and farther apart from each other. When we measured the expansion, it turned out that it was not slowing down at all. It was actually speeding up. And 
that was wild. That was like, if you throw a ball up into the air, it slows down for a little while and then just shoots off into space. You know, It's like very similar physics. And we didn't have any wild. idea why that should happen. Um, so we still don't know why that's happening. We attribute it to something we call dark energy. We don't know what dark energy is. It's just something that seems to be pushing things apart, making the universe expand faster. And because of that, it looks like we will we will end up, you know, with everything really, you know, all the galaxies really isolated, the stars will die away, the universe will get very dark, very cold, and, you know, we'll end up with this basically empty, cold, dark, lonely universe. And that's called the heat death. Uh, the reason it's called the heat death is because, like, everything's decaying into, like, the waste heat of creation. So, you know, just, just as, as you can't have a, a machine that's perfectly efficient, it'll always lose a little bit of energy through friction. That's a property of physics in general. It's called the second law of thermodynamics. Everything sort of decays into entropy, into disorder. And that is called heat uh, from a physics perspective. So the heat death is when nothing is left but the waste heat of the universe which is part of why it's fun to talk about the alternatives because we don't know for sure that the heat death will happen. Um, partially because we don't know what dark energy is. We don't understand this, this stuff that's making the universe expand faster. Maybe it's just a property of space where, you know, space just has this sort of expansion built in and it'll keep going the way it's going, but maybe it's something that changes over time. Maybe it'll turn around and we'll get a big crunch and everything will come back together, or maybe it'll become more powerful. And then you end up with something called a big rip, where if, if the dark energy becomes more powerful, it starts to not just move galaxies apart from each other, but actually expand the space in galaxies and move stars away from galaxies and then pull apart planets and stars and, and eventually destroy the entire universe. Um, so those are other possibilities that I talk about in the book because we we don't know what dark energy is and we don't know for sure what it'll do in the future. Um, I want to open up to some of the questions from the audience. Um, Vasily asks, have you ever asked the question, if there were no universe, what would there be? This leads to the question of what will be after the universe ends. Um, so I think I think that gets into tricky questions of how do you define universe, right? Um, so there's, you can define universe as being everything and then, and then it, it becomes a less clear question. What, what does it mean for, you know, something other than everything? Uh, then, you know, if there is anything else, it's de by definition part of the universe. Um, but one of the ways we, we often talk about, uh, the universe in cosmology is we, we talk about the observable universe where the observable universe is the part of the cosmos we can see where the light has had time to reach us since the Big Bang. So I talked about that before, the edge of the observable universe is where we see that, that Big Bang light. Um, the, the actual universe, uh, we think, extends far beyond the edge of the observable universe. The observable universe is just a perspective thing. It's like a horizon when you're on Earth. You can only see so far because of where you're standing, but the Earth keeps going beyond the horizon. And, and similarly with, with the universe, we're pretty sure that it, it extends much, much farther than what we can see, what we can observe. Um, but there, we can see the observable universe and we can study, we can learn about the observable universe and we can't get any information about what's beyond it. So, you know, that brings up things like a multiverse where you can have regions of space that are so far away from us that they're effectively another universe. And those regions can, can have a totally different history, a totally different future, different laws of physics even. Um, so there are possibilities for things that, that carry on long after our observable universe is, you know, decayed into entropy um, or, or maybe meets another fate. <laughs> um, and, uh, and there are even possibilities where there could be like higher dimensions of space, like directions that we can't conceive that, uh, you know, have a space that's separated from us by, by some other dimension of space, some other direction that we don't, you know, it's perpendicular to all of our spatial directions, which I can't, I can't sort of envision, but, um, but mathematically that makes sense in some ways. So there are those kinds of possibilities. Um, 
And, you know, you can get into really weird stuff about the nature of space and time if you, if you really dig into it. Um, but in, in the book, I really just talk about our observable universe in terms of the fate of that, because that's all we can really study. I do, I do talk a little bit about the multiverse and, and the possibilities of, of other parts of space. But, um, but in terms of what happens when our universe is destroyed, I mean, it depends on how it's destroyed, whether there's, you know, the observable universe is, is over, but there's more space beyond it or not. Um, and that's, that's all the realm of, of speculation at the moment. So I want to switch gears a little bit um, because one of the articles that you wrote fairly recently talked about how time and space might not be real <laughs> and how there might be a deeper, more abstract mathematical yeah. reality to the universe and that time mm -hmm. and space might just be what we perceive. Can you tell yeah. us more about this? How is this possible? Talk about your mind doing backflips. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. This is this is really wild. So, <clears throat> I first I first heard about this a couple of years ago, uh, where <clears throat> somebody was talking about how if you do if you do calculations of particles interacting with other particles, like the kind of stuff relevant to particle collider experiments, where you're slamming protons into each other and measuring what happens to the the particles that come out. We, you can, there are ways to do those calculations where you can kind of put them into an abstract mathematical format and do the calculation. And then you get the same answer as if you do the calculation the usual way, assuming, you know, it's actually particles moving through space and, and interacting with each other in space, in time. Um, and since there are ways to do some of these calculations without making use of the ideas of space or time, you just have this sort of abstract mathematical space, it sort of suggests that maybe space and time are not helping you uh, and not necessary for understanding how these processes work. And there's actually a lot that, that you can calculate in physics in, at the sort of subatomic scale where space and time are not, not salient variables. They're not part of the calculation and you get the right answer when you, when you do that. Um, and that sort of hints at this idea that maybe space and time are not the, the fundamental things that govern how the universe works, that, that you don't have to assume that, 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 you know, everything happens in a background of a, of a space measured by time. If you talk to the theoretical physicists who are working in these areas and are actually doing these calculations, doing these equations, they will say things like, Oh yeah, we've we've known for years that the space and time are not fundamental. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> you know? I missed that memo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's totally, totally. And and you 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 dig down into it and they say, well, you know, maybe they're emergent. Maybe it's like, you know, they're they're sort of real, like we live in space, we we experience time, but but the actual sort of fabric of the universe is some other mathematical space that that just doesn't map well to space and time. There's not there's not the same kind of thing, doesn't follow the same kind of rules. But in some sense, you know, maybe we are mathematical, you know, some kind of instantiation of, of mathematics rather than objects in space existing in time. And, and, and that's the more fundamental thing. And it's just that we, because of the, our perspective, because of our experience, we, we think we see objects in space and time. In fact, uh, that, is, that is not what space, what, you know, what the universe is really made of. I love that. Um, you know, it turns out you are also a poet. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm wondering, I feel, I really love your, your poem, Disorientation. And I feel like it states this really beautifully, actually. I was wondering if you'd be willing right. to read the last few stanzas. Sure, sure. Yeah, um, I can do that. Um, yeah, so this, this was a poem I wrote a few years ago. And I, I wrote it as a Twitter thread, actually, just because I thought it would, be, it would be kind of fun. So each stanza is a tweet. Um, <laughs> but uh, but it, it, it sort of encapsulates sort of how I think about the universe. So yeah, this is the last bit. Um, I want you to believe that the universe is a vast, random, uncaring place in which our species, our world, has absolutely no significance. And I want you to believe that the only response is to make our own beauty and meaning and to share it while we can. I want to make you wonder what is out there, what dreams may come in waves of radiation across the breadth of an endless expanse, 
what we may know given time and what splendors may never ever reach us. I want to make, I want to make it mean something to you that you are in the cosmos, that you are of the cosmos, that you are born from stardust and to stardust you will return that you are a way for the universe to be in awe of itself. I love that. Thank you so Thank much, you. Katie. Thank you for such a thoughtful and engaging conversation. It's really been such a pleasure.